Good morning. I'm Dr. Ari Belligan, and I'd like to welcome uh, all of you to what has become an incredible display of our burgeoning Los Angeles biotech ecosystem uh, and world-class academic centers, research institutions, and bioscience companies. I'm proud to be part of this collaborative network and thrilled by the growing interest of Los Angeles Best, now commands from leaders throughout the biopharma world. Which brings me to our keynote speaker. Today, we are incredibly privileged to welcome Dr. Albert Bourla to LA Best. Often, we think of presidents and prime ministers when we think of those who lead in times of war or crisis. As the chairman and chief executive officer of Pfizer, not only is Al one of the greatest leaders we have in our industry, but he has also proven himself to be steady hand and trusted global leader during one of the world's greatest crises in modern times. Very few can say uh, they have been tested at this scale. Much like innovation that was discussed here, that type of preparedness doesn't happen overnight. During his more than 30 years at Pfizer, Al has built a diverse and successful career, holding several senior positions across range of markets and disciplines. The global nature of his work, having lived and worked in nine different countries and cities around five continents has informed his understanding of the needs of patients and healthcare systems around the world and deepened his commitment to helping ensure equitable access to medicines and vaccines. Little did he know when he took the reins as CEO in January of 2019, that the world will soon be watching his every move and that many would be counting on him and the team at Pfizer to bring people around the world back to normal. When he took on the role as CEO, Al accelerated Pfizer transformation to become a more science and innovation driven company. He boldly divested its consumer and off patent product businesses, including iconic brands like Advil, Centrum, Lipitor, Norvace, Viagra, and dramatically increased its research and development in digital information technologies. Two years later, it turned out to be the best decision he has made. The Pfizer team was able to become the first company to receive an FDA approval for emergency use authorization for COVID-19. And during the same month of December 2020, the UK, Israel, European Union, and WHO all authorized the Pfizer vaccine. In his book, Moonshot, Inside Pfizer's Nine-Month Race to Make the Impossible Possible, Al described this nine months as, and I quote, the most challenging and the most rewarding in my life, both personally and as a leader. Al's list of accolade is long and well-deserved. In January 2022, he was named the 2022 uh, Genesis Prize Laureate in recognition for his leadership during pandemic. In 2021, he was named CEO of the year by CNN Business, included in the Insiders Magazine Most Transformative CEO list, and was inducted into the Cranes New York Business 2021 Hall of Fame. That same year, he received the Appeal of Conscious Award in recognition of his extraordinary leadership in service of global community 
and the Atlantic Council Distinguished Business Leadership Award for his and Pfizer work on COVID-19 vaccine. It is now my honor to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Albert Bula, to the stage. Thank you, Ari, for this very kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today in this uh, inspiring space. I'm sure that when Meyer and René Laskin made their generous donation to work the construction of this magnificent conference center, they spoke about the importance of creating a space at the university where people could come together to solve complex problems. As a premier showcase for biosciences innovation in Southern California, the Los Angeles Best strives to do just that. The life sciences sector has never known a time that it is all at once so exciting, daunting, and promising. There is a tremendous need for medical innovation in an aging society, both in the US and around the world. At the same time, Advances in digital technologies, together with advances in biology, are enabling us to deliver game-changing solutions for patients across a wide range of therapeutic areas. And biotechs, as an ecosystem, are playing an increasing role in the delivery of these breakthroughs. Unfortunately, we are also facing increased policy challenges around the world that are threatening to stifle innovation to stifle innovation and delay the delivery of breakthroughs to patients. This morning, I want to touch uh, on each of these trends and to the importance of maintaining an innovative and productive life sciences sector that will benefit patients and society at large. I will start with the challenges being brought on by our aging population. People around the world are living longer. According to the WHO, the number of persons aged 60 years and over will increase from 1 billion in 2020 to 1.4 billion in 2030. And by year 2050, the number is expected to exceed 2 billion. The number of persons aged 80 years or older is expected to increase at an even faster pace tripling between 2020 and 2050 to reach almost 500, more than 400. On the one hand, this is a very good thing. With age comes wisdom, the chance to pursue more of new interests, and the joy of creating more memories with the loved ones. Unfortunately, living longer also brings a host of chronic health challenges, from hearing loss and cataracts, to start with some simple, to increased incidence of such delibitating, delibitating conditions as osteoarthritis, cancer, heart diseases, diabetes, dementia, and I can go on and on. According to the National Council of Aging, nearly 95% of older adults in the U.S. have at least one chronic condition, and nearly 80% they have two or more. Chronic diseases takes a toll not only on the individual, which is, of course, the most important, but also on the healthcare system. According to the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, 90% of the United States' 4.1 trillion annual healthcare expenditure, I repeat, 90% of that, are for people with chronic and mental health conditions. The good news is that we are at the cusp of what I call a scientific renaissance that will deliver incredible advances for patients, will deliver medical innovation that will address and take on these challenges. At Pfizer, we look forward to playing a leading role during this exciting time. Every action we have taken in recent years has been to transform Pfizer into an agile scientific powerhouse capable of addressing the world's most devastating diseases. As Ari, said before. In the summer of 2019, we announced the divestiture of our two non-science-based businesses. While these divestitures removed 
approximately 25% of our global revenues. I repeat, 25% of our global revenues. They also helped strengthen our focus on where we believed we could have the greatest impact on patients and society, which is de developing and delivering innovative biopharmaceutical medicines and vaccines. The divestiture of those two non-science-based assets was accompanied by an increased investment, despite the fact that our revenues were 25% lower, on R&D. From 2019 to year 2022, our R&D expenses increased from 8.4 billion to 11.4 billion, and we expect them to grow again in this year, in 2023. But of course, transforming such a large, historic business and organization like Pfizer to be more science and innovation focused couldn't happen just by changing the portfolio of businesses, the products we have, or our capital allocation, more in digital or more in R&D. The important thing was to change the company's culture. We needed to become more comfortable with risk and to move boldly to live up to our purpose and our promise to patients. At Pfizer, this culture, we decided that it's defined by four values. Courage, excellence, equity, and joy. Those were introduced in 2019 as well. And I believe strongly that these values were a big reason why we were able to be successful and deliver what we deliver during the pandemic, not only a safe and effective vaccine, but also a safe and effective oral treatment for COVID. Without courage, I don't think we have made the decisions to choose mRNA, which at the time had not yielded an approved product. It was an unproven technology over technologies with which we were way more familiar and we knew that had delivered vaccines. Without courage, we wouldn't be able to deny taking money from the government that came with a lot of strings attached. Excellence, which is our second value. I don't think without demonstrating excellence in the way we execute, we couldn't have produced 3 billion doses of this vaccine in the first year when our annual production before that of all vaccines all over the world were 200 million doses. From 200 million doses, we went to 3 billion for a vaccine that was never made before. There was not manufacturing lines established in the first year. And of course, we couldn't conduct such a large study in nine months instead of the years that it usually takes. Equity. Our commitment to equity led us to make the right decisions at the time that this vaccine could be sold to anyone for whatever price. We decided to implement a tier pricing, tier based on a country's ability to pay. High income countries, we offer the vaccine at the cost of a takeaway meal. But middle income, which is known here, but middle income countries were offered at half that price and low income countries at cost. And in addition, we work with the US government to offer, manufacture and offer one billion doses of this vaccine to the poor countries completely free, delivered at their airport. And finally, speaking about joy, we saw that joy in the pride and dedication demonstrated by our colleagues who worked around the clock because they understood the importance and the impact of their work. That was really fueling their, their uh, drive. Now, the healthcare industry is being completely rewired, though. Technologies such as AI, machine learning, and supercomputing are turbocharging discovery and development of breakthrough medicines and enhancing efforts to prevent disease, detect disease early, deliver both personalized treatments and digital therapies. Let me share a few examples of how Pfizer is leveraging some of these technologies for the benefit of patients. Let's start with artificial intelligence, discussions about which and its real world impacts have really ramped up over the past year. However, 
the life sciences community has long understood before chat DPT that the technology of AI represents an increased, incredible opportunity to drastically change the course of global health. At Pfizer, we're using AI to understand disease pathophysiology so we can identify the best place in a disease process for a medicine to intervene. We are using AI to optimize our medicines and to find out and design the best molecules to stop or slow down disease. And we are using the technology to identify predictors of patient response and analyze high dimensional data to find biomarkers for how different patient types will respond to a medicine. Since 2018, Pfizer has also used machine learning based techniques such as computational modeling and simulation to streamline the process of designing new medicines. We are moving from drug discovery to drug design. Enab by enabling rapid screening of large numbers of candidate drug molecules to identify those that we can further investigate. Today, we can more accurately predict how a drug may interact with its molecular target, where it will go in the body, and how it may play out in the broader context of the disease. We are also advancing the next wave of antibody engineering, multi-specific antibodies, by leveraging our in-house translational modeling, machine learning, and AI capabilities, and our internal network for robust and efficient manufacturing. I'm very excited about this platform, the AI, because it can help us design antibodies that target two or three epitopes in a single therapeutic with potential utility, inflammation, and that I didn't expect to happen. <laughs> when it comes to supercomputing, Pfizer has invested in capabilities that are helping scientists accelerate new compounds through discovery to clinical development. This includes investment in technology to enable the acceleration of virtual in silico screening capabilities through cloud-based supercomputing. Virtual in silico screening involves using sophisticated computational models and simulation techniques to test molecule compounds in a virtual lab environment, rather than having to test all of them in a physical wet lab setting, which could take much longer. The capability enables us to synthesize and test a smaller fraction of the millions of known compounds that might work as a new drug, quickly narrowing down to those with the highest likelihood of success. In fact, supercomputing allows us to run very complex calculations five to 10 times faster and has reduced overall computation times by 80 to 90%. When it comes to also allowed us supercomputing, to deploy advanced, um, uh, advanced analytics to optimize the search for the right molecules that could deliver Paxlovid, which is our oral treatment, in a pill versus intravenously. The results was patients being able to take Paxlovid at home rather than having to administer it in a hospital setting, reducing the burden on hospitals, which were already at capacity treating patients with serious COVID-19 complications and where the injectable products were able to be advanced. Another trend that we see as promising is the continued rise of the biotech industry, which could be very relevant in this audience, which is a major engine of innovation and growth responsible for an increasing percentage of promising research candidates. Since 2018, which is just five years ago, the number of biotechs has increased by 35%, more than one third. And their impact has grown even more. Small biotechs either developed or contribute meaningfully to 55% of the top 20 drugs in 2021. This number in 2002 was just 15%. From 15 to 55 percent, innovation came from biotechs. And that is an increased trend. The pandemic heightened our recognition that many of today's more disruptive global healthcare challenges are too great for any one organization to tackle alone, require world class collaboration to fuel game changing innovation. 
Pfizer benefited from many collaborations through our partnerships with biotech companies. But probably the most famous one of the last two years is our partnership with BioNTech on our COVID-19 vaccine. Each company brought something distinct and complementary to the table. And because of that, we achieved the extraordinary to deliver safe and effective vaccines in just nine months. Moving forward, we want to repeat this story multiple times. We want to help catalyze the biotech ecosystem to help transform some of the most promising candidates into medicines and deliver more breakthroughs for more patients more quickly. Because when it comes to health, time is life. Quickly matters. We have a long history of partnership across the ecosystem and we have continuously sought to collaborate with biotechs because we know how vital they are a significant source of new molecular innovation. As such, we continue to explore a variety of ways to collaborate, to drive growth and value. Whether it would be acquisition, but also partnership or support models that bring our expertise and services to smaller companies with promising technologies. Expertise and services that they need to advance their ideas. And we are focused largely in the therapeutic areas and platforms where we have the scientific skills and acumen to deliver the most impact, where we know them well. Areas like oncology, inflammatory conditions, cardiovascular, metabolic diseases, hematological diseases. As well, we are engaging with companies with technology platforms that have the potential to fuel multiple products, such as protein degrades, multi-specific antibodies, traditional antibodies, and more. Ultimately, ultimately, we will seek a greater balance between internal and external innovation because we think that this is what times demands. And we aim to reach the most patients with our most impactful breakthroughs as quickly as possible. We see these potential collaborations as significant source of innovation that will be critical not only for Pfizer's future, but also for the future of the biotech sector and as a result for the future of global health. And this leads me to my final point. One of the most important things to come out of the pandemic has been the recognition of the power of science in the hands of a vibrant life sciences sector. If we didn't have a collaborative ecosystem where the private sector could work in collaboration with academia, governments, regulators around the world, along with a strong and predictable IP system to incentivize innovation, we wouldn't have any of the solutions that we have today. And our days still would be dark. This teamwork that spanned the public and private sectors during the crisis of the pandemic was not necessarily the normal way of working, but it is what allowed us to move with such incredible speed without sacrificing safety or quality. So one could help that that would be a lesson if we were able to do it with COVID, why we can't do it for cancer or Alzheimer's. But as I stand here today, we are in danger of erasing much of the progress made over the past three years due to policy changes that threaten to stifle innovation. Here in the US, when passing the Inflation Reduction Act, Congress missed a rare opportunity, a rare opportunity to address fundamental flaws within the US healthcare system that drive costs higher for all patients. To truly lower costs, it's critical that Congress address all the drivers behind what patients pay, including holding middlemen accountable for their role in making patients pay high out-of-pocket costs for the medications. On average, double than they buy the medicines themselves from us. On average, 50% the rebates. Instead, the IRA establishes a price setting system that allows the government to dictate the value and price of central prescription drugs. But by giving the government such overreaching authority, the IRA has undermined the development of future breakthrough treatments and cures in our country by reducing incentives to invest. The IRA brings our country closer to the price controls used by governments in the UK and Europe. 
if similar controls become commonplace in the US, they could dramatically decrease patients' access to needed medications. In fact, estimates suggest that IRA could result in upward of 100 fewer new medicines, 100 fewer new medicines coming in the market in the next two decades. Congress should prioritize real policy solutions to confront rising costs and move away from policies that could have consequence for innovation and patients long after inflation has subsided. But the US is not the only place that we are facing challenges. I was recently in Japan for a meeting and a series of conversations with top policymakers. For decades, Japan has built a reputation as a global leader in life sciences and an important partner in developing new medicines. In recent years, however, several policy changes related to drug pricing have put the country's biopharmaceutical industry at a competitive disadvantage. As a result, Japan's share of the early stage pipeline project has decreased dramatically, and the country has experienced both stagnation in new clinical trials and a return of the drug lag where innovative medicines take a much longer time to launch in Japan than in other countries, years after. The upcoming reform year represents an important opportunity to reverse these negative trends. It is critically important that the country's policy framework prioritize and further strengthen the ecosystem. And let me finish with Europe. The recently published proposals to revise the US pharmaceutical legislation contain some positive measures that will step, help streamline and, future, and future-proof the EU, EU's regulatory system. An example being the introduction of the electronic patient information leaflet, rolling review of data, regulatory sandboxes to test innovative ideas, and processes, and many others. We also welcome the proposal to establish an EU-level incentive for antimicrobial R&D. However, these benefits are outweighed by a number of provisions that, if included in the current form, will weaken the incentives dramatically. For example, the proposal to reduce the baseline duration of regulatory data protection from eight years to six years will increase uncertainty in the EU incentives framework, negative impacting investments in the sector, and Europe's global competitiveness. Similarly, increasing conditions and obligations on how we develop, manufacture, and supply our medicines will create an unpredictable and unattractive investment environment in Europe. I would like to close my keynote speech today with a quote from uh, uh, someone in a co-patriot of mine. He made it thousands of years ago. It's, his name is Eschylus. And uh, he's a great uh, dramatist. And um, he said something that translates better in Greek than in English, but uh, it, it is, the fight doesn't wait for those who delay to come to it. And um, our fight is against disease. And in this fight, we cannot delay because patients are waiting. The speed at which we deliver future breakthroughs will be enabled by unleashing flexible regulatory and policy paradigms fit for innovation yet to be discovered while keeping patient safety at the forefront. The tools of the 21st century can help us sharpen our rate of success even more, giving more precision in our hypothesis and technological innovations to enable and validate crisp thinking. With a strengthening innovation ecosystem, fueled in large part by the ingenuity, patients' first mindset, and entrepreneurial spirit of the biotech industry, I expect to see a dramatic impact on human health over the next two decades, where we can hopefully cure many currently incurable conditions, transform others into manageable chronic diseases from death sentences, and to better prepare for future pandemics. That's a future we can create together. Thank you for having me today. Stay well.